Okay, in this part of the lecture, we're going to start with section 1.3, Science is Based on Both Observation and Reasoning. That's the heading. The natural sciences is often a department at a university, um, the Department of Natural Science. You may see that. That title or that category um, covers all the life sciences and all the physical sciences. So the natural science is a, a larger umbrella heading. And within that, there's two basic branches, the life sciences, that's biology. Physical sciences includes physics, chemistry, and then geology and atmospheric science and such. We usually just say chemistry and physics. So natural sciences splits into biology, and then the other side of it would be chemistry and physics. However, it's a little bit of an, I mean, it's quite a bit of an artificial division because you can't study biology without studying physics and chemistry because all of life is following the rules of chemistry and physics. So, but in any case, that is the way it's typically split. All right, so what is science? Science in general aims to understand the natural world through observation and reasoning. You always start with observation. You see something that's cool, you don't know what it is. A lot of times you're just gathering information about the thing. It could be something you, um, like an object, or it could be some kind of process. But a lot of science starts off very descriptive. At some point though, you have questions and you need to develop an experiment to answer those questions. And that's where we use a systematic approach to figure out things as best we can. And that's called the scientific method. So when you're studying science in school, there's often, in my opinion, too much emphasis on the scientific method alone. But the observational part of it and the questioning in your head that doesn't need to have any um, experiment attached to it immediately is also really important. So in my opinion, the observation should be emphasized just as much as the scientific method part. Now, we always use reasoning um, and we always understand that we can only um, reasonably assess the data that we have. So based on what we know right now, what is the most reasonable conclusion? That's always part of science is that we agree that it's just based on what we know right now. If new information comes in, then we have to reassess. So based on what we know right now, the most logical uh, conclusion is such and such. All right. So remember, it's just it's just reasoning that's sound. Sound reasoning is what we're asking for. Um, so science aims to understand the natural world through observation and reasoning. Scientists attempt to be as objective and logical as possible in ranking hypotheses and in interpreting data and results. So what we mean is that what scientists do is usually you have more than one hypothesis possible explanation for something. And based on data, you rank which one of those is most likely to be true. So just like a doctor, when he listens to all of your symptoms, and then he ranks which what is wrong with you, what is most likely wrong with you, or what is most likely causing the problem. And then if he tests for the first thing and the test shows that's not the problem, then he can go to the second most likely hypothesis and test that thing. So it's all process of elimination based on what's most likely to least likely. And then you gather more data and you reassess. That's all it is. It's nothing magical. It's just logic. Scientists use a systematic approach. Like I said, descriptive science is that observational side. A lot of science is very descriptive. you got to start somewhere. You have to start with what can we figure out right now. Then you, can, might, you might formulate hypotheses that can be tested, 
and they have to be testable. Um, a hypothesis doesn't have to be true in the end, but it has to be your best, your best guess or explanation or a list of possible explanations, and it has to be testable. So we can't, there are things that we can't test. Um, an example would be, are there ghosts? Are ghosts real? That's not really testable because nobody can seem to agree on what evidence would indicate that it is, that they are real. So there's no scientific definition or agreed upon um, evidence for that. So nobody can ever seem to come, like, come to a conclusion on that. So in science, we're limited to things that are testable, reasonably testable. Um, and they, the hypothesis has to be falsifiable. In other words, there must be some kind of result that's possible that would lead you to reject your hypothesis. If every imaginable result would cause you to support your hypothesis, then you have not set up a fair test. So hypotheses can be supported or rejected, and that's perfectly fine. Like I said, if you reject the first hypothesis, that leads you to test the second one. So it's always a process of elimination. In fact, very often the first one is wrong. That's not uncommon. So only with repeated experimental support, eventually you get to the hypothesis that you can support over and over again, then we um, accept that. You don't really prove anything with 100% certainty because that isn't possible. But we repeatedly support something, then it becomes what we say accepted. With new data, though, it could be later rejected. So it's, um, it's always an ongoing process. In terms of experiments, we will be um, looking at some experiments and the key to experiments are that you can only test one variable at a time. So you have a control group and an experimental group. Um, for example, let's say you've got a new drug and you think that it helps lower blood pressure. Then what you do is you separate your participants into two groups. One group gets the drug, one group does not get the drug. You measure their blood pressure before they take the drug, you measure everybody's blood pressure after, and then you compare. So there has to just be one variable. Okay, and on this slide, we're going to look at a word. It's called theory. What is a theory? The word theory can be used in two ways. And unfortunately, there are opposites. A scientific theory, and that's why I put it in red, a scientific theory is something that is a big idea, consists of many concepts, and it is supported by so much evidence and reasoning that we're as close to being certain of it as we can get. There, there really isn't a one result that could topple the whole theory. So the theory of gravity or cell theory, these things are supported by lots of evidence. They're very broad and big and they're solid-ish. As solid as you can get in science, I should say. Um, so for example, cell theory says that all living organisms are made of one or more cells. They, um, all cells come from other cells by cell division, and the cell is the smallest unit that is considered alive. And so everything we've ever found falls into that. So it just doesn't seem that we're going to disprove cell theory. All right, now here's the problem. There's a casual meaning of the word theory. So, if you have a theory about why your um, friend has ghosted you, basically you don't know, but you have a theory. When you say that, you, you have an idea, you have a guess. 
So that's the casual meaning of the word theory. If, if you, you don't really know, but you could guess. You might be right, you might be wrong. So scientific theory is the thing that we're like as certain as we can be that it's correct. And the casual meaning of theory is just a guess. So unfortunately, you have to discern in casual conversation, usually people are using the casual meaning of the word theory. But in this class, when we talk about cell theory or evolutionary theory, we're using the scientific version of the word theory. We're using, we're referring to a scientific theory, something that we are, that is very well supported. So be sure you're clear on the two definitions of that word theory. Now, there are two kinds of science. Well, we've talked about two kinds in terms of descriptive science and hypothesis-based science. So that, that, those two types of science are looking at a certain aspect of science. Are we describing something or are we trying to answer an experimental question? So that's two um, ways of thinking about science. On this slide, we're thinking about another aspect of science, and we're going to use the words basic science and applied science. Basic science, when you use that um, phrase, what you're saying is somebody is doing science, and we're talking about research science in this case, um, without any particular purpose other than just to know how something works or how something is. We may, we may be answering a question, we may be doing an experiment, but there's not really any clear application, like we're not there's no a problem that we're solving other than just to know the answer to the scientific question. Okay, so if I am studying um, the structure of the skin of an octopus, and that's all I tell you, you know, that's it, just to know, just to understand how the structure is in an octopus's skin, then based on that information, you would say that's basic science just to know something about the world, just to know something about a living organism. Applied science, though, or technology, applied science is where you have a purpose, like you're going to study um, how a cancer drug affects individuals with, um, you know, a certain um, type of cancer and does it cure them or whatever. So in that case, there's a clear like purpose to help somebody or to use it to solve a problem. So when I ask you if something is basic science or applied science, there will be an example. And basic, even if you can imagine what something could be used for, if it doesn't state what the use is, then you can answer that it's basic science. So like if I say to study the structure of an octopus's skin, and that's all I say, then you'll say basic science. If I say to study the structure of an octopus's skin to see if it could be used to graft on burn victims, which I just made that up, but if, if there's like an application, like something that can be used to help somebody, then that's applied science. So just when I ask you questions about this, just read what the information that's given. Um, and there are plenty of things in basic science that when we study them, we don't know that if they'll be useful. We're just trying to create a large pool of knowledge. And then later, what does happen is things that were basic science when they were first studied, then later somebody realizes it can be part of applied science. So then we go in and we pull that knowledge out and then we use it to develop something useful. So basic science um, typically has to happen first. Some things we study never have a purpose, but we never know what's going to be useful and what isn't. So we study as much as we can in the basic science realm, and then um, we move to, in, for some of those things, we can move into applied science. Do not underestimate the role of serendipity, luck, 
Now, there's no such thing truly as luck. Sometimes you stumble across something when you're doing research. However, you have to recognize when you do it, you have to recognize what it is. But there is some luck in science. And what I mean is the first discovery I made that got me a publication, we were studying a chromosome rearrangement in uh, cyanobacteria. And we got the result that we were doing a certain kind of experiment and we got the result and we were like, that doesn't look right. And so you repeat it again because usually it, you screwed it up. So we repeated it again and it still looked the same. And we were like, that can't be right. And then we did it a third time and it still came out the same. And at that point we looked at it really closely and we were like, oh my gosh, this means something that we didn't know before has to be true. But we had to repeat it over and over again to make sure we just didn't mess up the experiment. And then we had to study it and figure out what it does, what it told us. But we stumbled across it in a way. And so we say that it, there was some serendipity there. There was some, uh, a fortunate accident sometimes happens, or you, you just stumble across something that you didn't even, you weren't looking for, but when you see it, you think about it and you realize you've got something new. So there is a lot of that in science. Um, let me think, there's probably a couple other, it, it happens. Um, but you have to be prepared and you have to use your brain and figure out what's going on. So it's not total dumb luck, it's, you know, it's luck in a sense. And sometimes you think that you're researching one topic and then you find something more interesting and you go in that direction. So there's a lot of that kind of thing in science, which makes it kind of fun. Um, when you have a discovery, something nobody's ever discovered before, then the only place you publish it is called a peer-reviewed journal. Peer-reviewed means other scientists who are experts in that same particular field will read your paper and make criticisms, uh, suggestions, and how to make the paper stronger or more supported. Sometimes that means you have to go back and do more experiments. Um, it does not mean that they repeat all of your experiments. So they assume that the results you got are legitimately the results you got. And, you know, if you get caught faking data, your career is over. So in general, that doesn't happen. I'm not going to say that's never happened, but it's fairly rare because it will end your career. So a peer reviewed journal looks at the data that you report and makes sure everything looks um, that, it, that the data that you show supports the claim that you're making. And so in, in biology, the premier journals, like the top notch journals are called Nature, Cell and Science. And I have these, let's see, I've got, this is Nature. Let's see if I can put that up, that's Nature. This is Science. I have stacks and stacks of these in my office. And this is cell. So I get these at a reduced rate because I'm an educator. And I'm not gonna claim that I read all of them every week, but I flip through and I, for, for me, I look for the genomics um, papers and I keep current on those things. Genomics is my expertise area. Um, I skip past a lot of other topic areas because nobody can be an expert in everything. We have to depend on each other as experts. But I can flip through and see what's currently happening in the field that I am an expert in. Um, most journals require manuscripts to be in what we call the IMRAD format. IMRAD means introduction, methods, results, and discussion. And then they will also have an abstract, which is a summary. Sometimes now they just write summary. And then your, all your references. So basically what a paper in one of these journals is, 
is it gives you an introduction, which gives you all the background of all the research that's led up to this point with all those references. And then the methods and results for the research that that scientist did and the discussion of how that moves the field of research forward in that particular area. So each paper, each publication moves a particular research area forward just a little bit usually. And so these come out every week. Um, Cell, I think, is once a month or every two weeks. But these come out, there's tons of papers that come out all the time, and it's it's hard to keep up with everything, and nobody, nobody can keep up with everything. But you focus on your particular expertise area. Now we move into um, section 1.4. The study of evolution is a good example of scientific inquiry. Uh, I'm not going to go into evolution too heavily other than to cover the basics that I put on your learning objectives at the beginning of the chapter. Um, there was um, a scientist or a naturalist, probably they would have called themselves at the time, um, Lamarck. Lamarck had um, a theory of evolution, but um, his theory of evolution, I mean, at that time, people recognized that organisms change over time, at least to some extent, not to the extent that we now know, but they, they did recognize that at least to some extent. But Lamarck said that organisms changed over time based on what the organisms did during their lifetime. So, for example, the most famous example from Lamarck is he said a giraffe um, used to have, the species giraffe used to have a shorter neck, but he stretched his neck to get leaves from the trees higher up, and over time, he passed that stretched neck onto his children, and they stretched their necks. To, and that was passed on to their children, and now giraffes have this really long neck. Now, I want to be clear, that's wrong. <laughs> but that was Lamarck's um, theory of evolution. Now, evolution says organisms change over time, but it, they don't change over time because they tried to stretch their neck, and so therefore it, it happens. Um, so Lamarck's theory of evolution is typically described as the inheritance of acquired characteristics. The inheritance of acquired characteristics. I wonder if I can type that in. Okay, inheritance of acquired characteristics. Um, and like I said, that's wrong, so you can put an X through that. But um, acquired means something you get during your lifetime. So if you stretch your neck on purpose, then your children will inherit a stretched neck. That's wrong. Um, so there was another naturalist named Darwin, young guy, and he, was, he took a trip a uh, five-year journey on the Beagle, that was the name of the ship, and he observed, so description, a very descriptive science, he observed different organisms in different island groups and um, collected a lot of um, specimens and brought them back to England and studied them. And Darwin realized that Lamarck seemed to be wrong. He also had studied a guy named Malthus. Malthus said, uh, in any um, ecosystem, there's going to be more individuals than can be supported. And then only the ones that are favored will survive. Um, or another way of looking at it is a, a population will increase until there's not enough resources for everyone. 
So Darwin was influenced by this thinking of Malthus, and Darwin came up with a different concept of um, evolution, and he called it natural selection. So he had an idea of evolution by natural selection. Now it turns out that natural selection isn't the only thing that, that causes evolution, but it was a big idea at the time, and that one does hold up. Since Darwin's time, we've added to it. But natural selection is an important part of evolution. So the inheritance acquired characteristics was wrong. Darwin's natural selection ends up being correct, but not the only mechanism of evolution. But in any case, what natural selection says is that organisms, when they, um, when a population exceeds the resources of an area, there's too many individuals, there's not enough resources, food, water, there will be naturally some organisms in that group who have just by chance were born with a better chance of being able to get the food or being able to hide from the predator than others. So we're talking about within a population, like think of mice. You've got a population of mice, some are brown, some are white, some are black, whatever. They're not born the color that they want to be, they're just born whatever color they're born with. But if the brown ones are able to hide better from the predator, then naturally they'll, they'll live longer and probably have more babies than the black or the white ones who are more easily seen, let's say in a forest. So whoever, you're born with whatever you're born with, you don't get to choose. But if you happen to be born with traits that give you an advantage in a certain situation, and that allows you to live and reproduce more, then more of those traits will be passed on to the next generation. If you happen to be born with traits that cause you to be killed or not reproduce as well, then your traits will not be passed on. And so if you think about this process running over a long period of time, then what it means is that over time, a population will tend to have more and more of what we call the favored traits, or we say that the population is adapted to the environment. So that's the concept of natural selection uh, in, a, in a pretty short um, way of explaining it. Um, so Lamarck was wrong, Darwin was at least partially right, and that set up the beginning of our um, understanding of evolution. It's not the end of the story, and if you take a biology 1407, you get to delve quite a bit more into evolutionary theory. But for now, that's, that's where we're going to go with it. All right. So a few concepts from the core of biology. Number one, life is subject to chemical and physical laws. Another way of saying it is life science depends on the physical sciences. Everything in, in uh, the body follows the same laws as anything that's not in the body. It's just everything is subject to the same laws. So there's nothing special um, in that sense. Number two, structure determines function. This is probably one of, probably the most important one in my opinion. In other words, let's say you have a hammer which has a wooden handle and a big head at the top. So a hammer is good for hitting a nail. But you also have a, a small shovel with a wood handle and a metal part, metal trowel part, the scoop part, and that's not as good for hitting a nail. Now they're both made out of the same material, but one of them has a structure better suited to hitting a nail, one of them has a structure better suited to digging a hole. Okay, so the structure, not only the, the makeup of something, but also the shape of it. So the, the, the chemistry of the materials, but also the shape, structure is the material and the shape, determines the best function for that item. Now, obviously a shovel and a hammer are not living 
things, but in a cell, you will find that, the, that there are tools of a sense and that the shape and the makeup of the tools will determine their function and will, will match their function in a way. Number three is that living systems transform energy and matter. I mentioned this in the first section uh, of this lecture. Energy flows through an organism and matter flows through, not flows through, but matter is exchanged between an organism and its environment. You take in food, you release waste. That's what we call it. Um, you take in energy, you release energy. So there has to be an an exchange, a transformation of energy between the organism and its environment, and there has to be an exchange or a transformation of matter between an organism and its environment. And if either one of those is not happening, then that can be a definition of death. Living systems depend on information transactions. That is... Um, a really weird way of talking about genetics and inheritance, information transactions. So we'll get to that in the last part of this course. And number five, evolution explains the unity and diversity of life in that over time, organisms get mutations and become different, but we all originated from the same one or a few cells. So there are some things about all organisms that are the same. So unity and diversity. All right, I'm going to take a break um, here and pick this up in a, a very short third segment of the lecture. So you might want to take a break right now and then come back to this, or you can go right on into the next lecture segment.